Aloha, brothers and sisters. Aloha. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you today, and especially to be introduced by my beautiful and wonderful wife. I recommend that you go over her devotional last week. What a wonderful devotional. And I listened to it when I was away. Remember, expect miracles. Expect, recognize, and appreciate, ERA. The topic of today's devotional has been weighing on me, actually, for a number of months, and I pray that you can feel the spirit. I've tried to make it kind of fun and interesting in some ways, memorable, but most importantly, I hope that we can learn together and that you will come away from the devotional changed in some way or another for the good. So this summer, when we were home, our cute red-headed seven-year-old grandson named James visited us in our home in Utah. This is his picture, very red his hair. James spent a lot of time playing with our other grandchildren in our backyard, and one of their projects, which lasted for days actually, involved digging in the backyard for bugs. We would often find old cottage cheese cartons on the back steps and patio filled with dirt and grass and all kinds of crawling things. One day, James showed us a to-do list that he had written to organize the morning's activities. I'm going to show it to you on the screen. This is it. I'll let you look at that for a second. Now I'll read it. It says, find roly-polies, uh, break, find worms, break, find ants, break, go inside. <laughs> well, after we chuckled over that for a while, uh, what struck me was uh, that James was already learning to discipline, to, to the discipline of time management. It doesn't far, fall far, far from the tree, actually, like his parents. So today I want to talk to you about discipline and discipleship. Discipline, discipleship. My intent is to encourage and invite and, if possible, inspire you to choose to become a more disciplined disciple. And I confess that this is a lesson that I need, too. I need to be just a little bit more like James, and I suspect that many of you do too. So what does it mean to be a disciplined disciple? Let me explain by looking at the original meanings of, dis of disciple and discipline. Both terms come from the same root, the same idea of following and learning from a master teacher. Discipline comes from the Latin discipulus. A discipulus is a follower or pupil of a master teacher. Disciples then submit themselves to be instructed and trained by a person or in an area of study they wish to follow. This strict training was called discipline. Discipl uh, th this discipline came from the word disciplina, which is what was required to become a discipulus. So discipl discipleship involves learning discipline, meaning instruction, rigorous training, or mastery of a body of knowledge and skill. So because such discipline was often administered with a firm hand, the term came to, came to be synonymous with correction or punishment. But its root meaning is actually instruction or training. Similarly, the verb to discipline didn't originally mean the idea of punishing, but the idea of teaching someone to follow rules with exactness in order to master, again, the skill or body of knowledge or code of conduct, like military discipline. The original meaning of discipline, then, is still evident in the term self-discipline. I think you can hear it there. When, when we think of self-discipline, we don't think of, a per, of people who are engaging in self-flagellation and punishment. Rather, we think of people who have self-control or willpower, people who have grit. So when I use the term disciplined disciple, I do so with these original meanings of the words in mind. A disciplined disciple follows the master with exactness and honor, like Helaman's stripling warriors. Disciplined disciples submit themselves to his will in the rigorous quest to become more like him. Their discipleship is demonstrated and developed by their discipline. Today, I encourage all of us to become more disciplined disciples. Developing disciplined disciples is really central to the mission 
of BYU-Hawaii. Elder Bednar once described BYU-Idaho as a disciple preparation center. In my view, this ought to be the function of every church school. It is certainly how I see the mission of BYU-Hawaii. Many of you have studied at the MTC. The role of the MTC is to train missionaries. Well, this university ought to be a DTC, a Disciple Training Center. Its role is to train up disciples for the Lord. We speak often of our mission as preparing learners, leaders, and builders. In fact, these are aspects of a broader mission to develop disciples. Learn, lead, build is a shorthand way of capturing President McKay's vision at our founding that this university was to prepare disciple leaders. He singled out three areas or disciplines in which they would be prepared here, in testimony, in character, and in intellect. President McKay said the first purpose for which this school was founded was to strengthen testimony. The core content of a, decree, of a curriculum for disciple leaders is the testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Such a testimony should burn in the heart of every disciple of Christ. But it is not enough just to know. I like what the Apostle Paul James observed. He said, the devils also believe in God and tremble. President McKay adds that the second purpose for which this university was built is character. He declared that this university exists to develop leaders who are men and women of integrity. Such disciple leaders do not simply know the truth. They live it. Remember, disciple means follower. Only those who follow the Savior merit the designation of disciples. Again, the, an the fallen angels understand and believe. Only disciples follow the Savior. Likewise, only leaders of high moral character qualify as leaders who may be called genuine gold. So nurturing testimony and character are the first and second grand purposes of this disciple training center, this DTC. These spiritual and moral objectives are higher than any narrowly academic aims. President McKay was fond of quoting this statement, character is higher than intellect. But he also believed deeply in the value of intellect. As an educator himself, he loved learning. He spoke eloquently at our founding of academic learning as part of disciplining disciple leaders here. On both occasions when President McKay dedicated the university, first the campus grounds and then the buildings, he quoted extensively from, the Doctrine, from Doctrine and Covenants 88, where the Lord invites his disciples in this dispensation to be instructed in all things, in theory and in principle, in things above, on, or under the earth, things at home and abroad, in history, government, languages, and so forth. He goes on and on with this curriculum. And why? Then the Lord affirms this, that the broad education that we should receive as disciples would prepare the saints to, quote, fulfill the mission with which I have commissioned you. Now, after quoting this in his dedicatory prayer at the Church College of Hawaii, President McKay goes on to explain it in these words. Thus, and this is in the prayer itself. Thus dost thou emphasize the fact that it is not sufficient, sufficient merely to testify to the world of the restoration, but to present the principles of the gospel in an intelligent manner that the honest in heart may be convinced of the truth and may be led from paths of error into, into the ways of righteousness. So according to President McKay and then to the Lord, the purpose of education is to train the intellect so that we may be better able to fulfill our mission to serve and to save the world. Hence, intellectual development is one of the key functions of a disciple training center here, just after it, our spiritual 
and moral functions, its spiritual and moral development. Fulfilling this purpose requires discipline, to, another sort of discipline, what is called academic discipline. Academic majors are also known as academic disciplines. Educated people are sometimes described as having been trained in the discipline of mathematics, physics, history, economics, and so forth. I don't know if you students are familiar with this usage. Some of you are. But it's common in the academy to refer to the bodies of knowledge that you study in your majors as disciplines. I want to invite today, invite and encourage you to become a disciplined disciple in this sense of discipline too, by becoming disciples who are disciplined in the academic disciplines we teach here. Disciples educated in disciplines may bring to their discipleship such things as a knowledge of chemistry, like a Henry Iron, the famous father of President Henry B. Iron, or of sculpting, like Avard, Avard Fairbanks, who sculpted the friezes for the Hawaiian temple, or, a, or fine legal training, like Dallin H. Oaks, or skill in thoracic surgery, like Russell M. Nelson, and we could go on and on with examples. While being a faithful disciple is the key thing, not one's educational training, educated disciples are able to lay on the altar gifts that the, Lord's, the Lord can use if they're humble, willing, and consecrated. Now is the time for you and all of us here to take full advantage of our opportunity to learn all we can. This will expand the scope of your service and allow God to use you in ways he otherwise could not. It will enable you to make greater contributions to the kingdom and to the world, to enjoy a more abundant life, and to experience greater freedom than you otherwise would had you not acquired self-discipline and academic discipline. Now, it may, see, it may seem odd and even counterintuitive for some to, for me to suggest that discipline will increase your freedom. On the surface, these two things appear to be opposites. Most people associate discipline with rules, restraints, obedience, and control, while freedom is associated with lack of restraint, spontaneity, nonconformity, even abandon. In fact, however, Discipline can enable greater freedom. I want to illustrate this paradox today by reading a picture storybook that I discovered as an undergraduate in college. I read it at the height of the hippie movement, not long before I left BYU for Berkeley. So the moment in, this moment in my personal life and in our national history uh, is part of the book's meaning for me, that hippie context kind of. The story is called The Dot and the Line. A Romance in Lower Mathematics by Norton Juster, who is the same one who wrote the author of The Phantom Toll Booth. The book tells of a love triangle between a dot, a line, and a squiggle. It's a, it's a little bit dated and it's kind of uh, sexist kind of telling the story, but it's really funny, useful, and I want to, and a lot of the humor and wit is packed in the illustrations. And you've got to like puns. I like puns. Shakespeare loved puns, so there are a lot of visual and verbal puns. So with the publisher's permission, I'm going to read this story to you. So sit back and enjoy. It's story time, folks. OK. So it starts like a lot of good fables. Once upon a time. Once upon a time, there was a sensible straight line who was hopelessly in love with a dot. You are the beginning and the end. Uh, the hub, the core, the quintessence, he told her tenderly, but the frivolous dot wasn't a bit interested, for she only had eyes for a wild and unkempt squiggle who never seemed to have anything on his mind at all. They were everywhere together, singing and dancing and frolicking and laughing and laughing and who knows what, what else. He's so gay and free, so uninhibited and full of joy, she informed the line coolly, and you are as stiff as a stick, dull, conventional, and repressed, tied and trammeled, subdued, squelched and quenched and stifled, 
Uh, anyway, all those things. Come around again when you get straightened out, kid, the squiggle added with a rasping chuckle as he chased her into the high grass. Why take chances, replied the line without much conviction. I'm dependable. I know where I'm going. I've got dignity. But this was small consolation to, for the miserable line. Each day he grew more, grew more and more morose. He stopped eating and sli and, or sleeping, and before long, he was completely on edge. This is one of my favorite puns of the book. It has the line on the edge of the page. <laughs> okay. He worried. More puns coming up. Just a pun alert. He worried. His worried friend noticed how terribly thin and drawn he had become and did their best to cheer him up. She's not good enough for you. She lacks depth. They all look alike anyway. Why don't, you settle, why don't you find a nice straight line and settle down? But he hardly heard a word that they said. Any way he looked at her, she was perfect. <laughs> he saw things in her no one else could possibly imagine. She is more beautiful than any, other, any straight line I have ever seen. He sighed wistfully, and they all shook his he their heads, even allowing for their feelings. They felt like this was stretching a point. <laughs> and so he spent his time dreaming of the inconstant dot and imagining himself as the forceful figure she was sure to admire. The lion is a celebrated daredevil. The lion is a leader in world affairs. <laughs> the lion is a fearless law enforcement agent. The line is a potent force in the world of art. The line is an international sportsman. But he soon grew tired of self-deception and decided that perhaps the squiggly line might be, have the, right, the answer after all. I lack spontaneity. I must learn to let go, to be free, to express the inner passionate me. But it just didn't make any difference. For no matter how often or how hard he tried, he always ended up the same way. And yet he continued trying and failing and trying again until when he had all but given up, he discovered at last that with great concentration and self-control, he was able to change direction and bend wherever he chose. And so he did and made an angle. And then again, he made another and another and another and another and then another and another. Hot stuff, he shouted, much impressed with his efforts. Then, in a wild burst of enthusiasm, he, set up, he sat up for half the night, putting on an outrageous display of sides, bends, and angles. <sighs> Freedom is not license for chaos, he observed the next morning. Oh, what a head. There and then, he decided not to squander his talents in cheap exhibitionism. For months, he practiced in secret. Soon, he was making squares and triangles, hexagons, parallelograms, rhomboids, polyhedrons, trapezoids, parallelopipeds, decagons, tetragrams, and an infinite number of other shapes so complex that he had to letter the sides and angles just to keep his place. Before long, he, had, he learned to, caref to carefully control ellipses, circles, and complex curves, and to express himself in, in any shape he wished. You name it, I'll play it. But all his success meant nothing to him alone. So off he went to seek the dot once again. He doesn't stand a chance, muttered the squiggle in a voice that sounded like bad plumbing. But the line, who was bursting with old love and new confidence, was not to be denied. Throughout the evening, he was by turns mysterious, clever, Dazzling, mis profound, complex, erudite, eloquent, versatile, enigmatic, and one of my favorite, compelling. The dot was overwhelmed. She giggled like a schoolgirl school and didn't know what to do with her hands. Then she turned slowly to the squiggle, who had suddenly developed a severe cramp. Well, she inquired, trying to give him every chance. The squiggle, taken by surprise, did the best he could. Is that all? She demanded. Well, I guess so, replied the miserable squiggle. That is, I suppose so. What I mean is, 
I never know how it's going to turn out. Hey, have you heard the one about the two guys who, the dot wondered why she hadn't, she had never noticed how hairy and coarse and he was and how untidy and graceless and how he mispronounced his L's and picked his ear. And suddenly, I like the way the dot keeps growing bigger and the squiggle gets smaller. And suddenly she realized that what she had thought was freedom and joy was nothing but anarchy and sloth. You are as meaningless as a melon, she said coldly, undisciplined, unkempt, and unaccountable, insignificant, indeterminate, and inadvertent, um, out of shape, out of order, out of place, and out of luck. And with that, she turned to the line and shyly took his arm. Do that one with all the funny curves again, honey, she cooed, softly as they strolled away. And he did. And soon they did. And, if, if, and, and soon uh, they did and lived, if not happily ever after, at least reasonably so. Exclamation point. To the vector belongs the spoils, is the moral of this story. <laughs> now, for me, and now I hope for you, this little romance in higher in lower mathematics makes unforgettably clear how discipline can result in higher order freedom. My message to you today could be rephrased this way. Don't be a squiggle. Be a spectacularly disciplined line. My favorite lines from Juster's story are these two quotes, both of which emphasize the connection between obedience and freedom. Quote, what she thought was freedom and joy was nothing but anarchy and sloth. And the other one is, freedom is not license for chaos. The last sentence draws on an old-fashioned, largely forgotten distinction between license and freedom, uh, license rather, and liberty. This was a distinction, by the way, that was very important to the founders. It was Constitution Day yesterday, like John Adams, or to defenders of liberty, like John Milton or Edmund Burke. Liberty refers to morally grounded freedom, freedom that is disciplined by virtue and self-restraint. License, by contrast, refers to irresponsible freedom, freedom without moral restraint, divorced from standards of personal conduct and decency. This meaning of license is preserved in such terms like licentious and licentiousness, meaning lacking moral restraint. Disciplined disciples enjoy true liberty, not as counterfeit license. They are not squiggles but lines. They know that true discipleship, like true freedom, is grounded in virtue and truth. As Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And the true, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The dot in the line also reminds us of another distinction that moral philosophers like to make between negative and positive freedom. This is the freedom, the difference between freedom from and freedom to, or you could talk about between may and can. Often we think about freedom primarily as freedom from various restraints. For example, freedom from restrictions on speech, on assembly, on travel, and so forth. This way of thinking about freedom leads some to feel that the students at BYU Hawaii uh, are that where they're not free because we have these restraints on dress and curfews and drinking and drugs and so forth. But this equates all freedom with negative freedom from the freedom of thou shalt not. It's the kind of let it out, let it all hang out freedom of the, of the, that the squiggle represents. But there's another kind of freedom, a higher order of freedom. I had to tell my Berkeley friends this when I got there. There is the positive freedom, too, that the line acquires after he disciplines himself to bend and curve however he chooses. Now, I'm going to illustrate this difference of freedom from and freedom to by using myself as a bad example. It's a little embarrassing. And I'm going to use Jennifer Durden as a good example. Let me go to the piano. Jennifer, do you want to come? So here I am at the piano. This is a lot scarier than the podium for me. And there's a beautiful piece of music here. I think you've got your own copy of this. It's Rachmaninoff. Now, 
I'm perfectly free to play this. There's nothing stopping me. After all, I'm the president. I can do about what I want. <laughs> and I want to play the piano. But I can't, alas, because when I was a little boy, I only took one piano lesson. And this was the piano lesson. This is up, this is down, this is up and down. This is up to D, this is, this is down again. Isn't that shameful? <laughs> now, my parents, my parents, they had 10 children at the time going on 13, and they couldn't afford, they said, to do piano lessons. But really, I'm responsible, not my parents. As an adult, I haven't demonstrated the discipline to learn to play on my own, so I blame my set myself that I never did the finger exercises, never practiced the scales, and never learned to read the notes. Now, Jennifer, come here. Do you want to just give this a shot? <laughs> I go to a lot of concerts. I love music, and I watch Jennifer and Stacy play, and they just, they can accompany anything and anybody and everybody, and it just amazes me. Uh, that is freedom. That is freedom, too. And with respect to the piano, I'm a squiggle. She's a line. Uh, I'm an undisciplined disciple. She's a disciplined disciple. Uh, because I haven't played the, paid the price to ex enjoy the positive freedom of playing the piano. Thanks for making me look that good. <laughs> so, now that was embarrassing. That was very embarrassing, but it made a point, I hope in a memorable way, that discipline can enlarge our freedom. It can allow us to be like a line rather than a squiggle. This is the time and place, brothers and sisters, for us to become more disciplined disciples. Now, I've been speaking to you today, I hope as I've been speaking to you today, you've felt prompted that you, to think of ways you may want to develop some more disciplines in your life. I know that I have as I've, as I've prepared this talk. And as I said much earlier, that this talk is as much about for, for me as for you. I encourage you to write these promptings down, sort of like James, that to-do list, although I like a to-become list even better because True discipleship is not just about acting like a disciple, it's about becoming a disciple. So, um, I'd like to, let's go, go down the script a little bit, keep moving, okay. I'd like to uh, um, talk about, just mention a few areas in which you may consider, to, you may want to learn some uh, discipleship. You may want to increase your discipleship in prayer. You may want to increase your discipleship in um, in fasting, in temple worship, in some of those issues. You may want to try to find a, develop a new language. You may want to uh, play a, new, a musical instrument. You may want to pick up a certificate. Some of you may be, feel inspired to even develop greater, to develop greater discipline in exercise. And so I'll see you in the pool at 5.30 in the morning. Or in your sleep habits, or in your diet, or in your study habits. Now, speaking of study habits, students, I want to give you a, a little piece of advice that was given a long time ago by President Oaks, then president of BYU, to the students there about a discipline he practiced as a student, which he said made all the, dis the difference in his life. He called it a master key of success in life. He attributed much of his success to following this discipline. This was his motto. He said, work first, then play. Work first, then play. This is powerful potentially life-changing advice for every one of the students and disciplined disciples. Think of it the next time you're tempted to go surf or go to a movie or go to a party when you need to first finish your homework. Follow Elder Oak's example. What he did is he used play as a reward he'd give himself for completing his work. I invite all of us also, in all the other things we're going to do, to review the Honor Code Commitment. 
Disciplined disciples are people of integrity. They are promise keepers, and we have each pledged to follow the honor code. Now, on the screen is a document that we, the students sign every year with a couple of phrases highlighted in yellow. Notice in that last phrase that we agree to follow these standards at all times and in all places, which means on and off campus. The Honor Code articulates broad eternal pr principles such as chastity, modesty, and honesty. It also stipulates some specific dress and grooming standards, such as being clean shaven and keeping hair trimmed above the collar for men, wearing shorts, skirts, and dresses that are knee length, and avoiding revealing uh, attire such as leggings and tights that aren't covered, and grubby attire such as ripped jeans. All of the, it also specifies proper beach attire, both to and from the beach and at the beach. I'm just going to read you what the Honor Code says about this, just as a reminder. Students should be dressed <coughs> in standard and be adequately covered to and from the beach, athletic activities, or exercise locations. Clothing, including swimming suits, must be modest in fabric, fit, and style. No bikini or French cut styles, no midriff showing. Modest shorts above the knees, sweats, and gym clothing are to be worn only in athletic and living areas. <clears throat> now, I emphasize these with the freshmen in the freshman fireside, and I've been pleased to see so many of the students following these standards that they've pledged to follow. I compliment you. I congratulate you who are adhering to the code. If any of you need to practice more strict discipline in your following the code, I encourage you to do so starting now. Living the honor code is more than about chastity, honesty, and modesty, and other important eternal principles. Though it is about these, it's also about being true to your word. <clears throat> it's about becoming disciplined disciples. Some honor code standards involve things that are intrinsically wrong, like cheating or being sexually promiscuous. Other standards are not inherently wrong, like growing a beard. You can have a beard and be a member of the church in good standing. But here at our DTC, there is a different standard from that which applies to the members of the church at large, just as there is in the MTC. Note that our general standard about dress and grooming at BYU-Hawaii could just as easily be made about missionaries. This is what it says. The attire and grooming of both men and women must always be modest, neat, clean, consistent with the dignity adherent to representing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, I'm often, I see my missionaries on, on the webpage, and sometimes they have beards. There's nothing wrong with that now. But if one of my missionaries started sporting an unshaved look on the mission field or wearing immodest shorts and ripped jeans, I would be less concerned about immodesty than I would about disobedience. And that's the way I feel when I see students out of standard. I'm less concerned about the failure to be neat and modest than I am about failure to keep your word. Now, again, most of you are doing really well in living the honor code, including the dress and grooming standard. The purpose of that is to help us develop disciplined disciples. And I congratulate you who are doing that. Now, let me conclude this talk by giving you a concrete example of a truly exemplary disciplined disciple, President Russell M. Nelson. He is a disciplined disciple without peer. His longtime secretary said, he is the most disciplined person I have ever known. And yet he's at the same time com a compassionate perfectionist toward others. I know of no one who better embodies the principle I'm trying to teach. We all know of President Nelson's amazing discipline as a heart surgeon, which required years and years of, of assiduous work. But did you know that unlike many doctors, he also disciplined himself to write in a neat and clear hand so that his handwriting would not be misread by his patients? This is a, a dedication from a book uh, his biography that he dedicated to Susan and me many years ago. Notice how beautiful that is and straight and neat and clear. That's what his handwriting is like. During his busy years as a physician, President Nelson also felt prompted that he should learn to play the organ. 
So he didn't have time, so he got up an hour earlier than usual to teach himself to pray, to play rather. And when he was called to the 12, he had the skill to become the organist for the brethren in their Thursday temple meetings. And then when he visited the saints in Vienna, he delighted them by playing Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D. President Nelson has also learned many languages so he could be more serviceable in the kingdom. When President Kimball challenged the church to prepare to take the gospel to China, then President, uh, Brother Nelson was then didn't have a church calling, but he immediately engaged a tutor to teach himself Mandarin, to teach him Mandarin so he could learn it. And this prepared him when he became a general authority to open doors to the People's Republic. As an apostle, he regularly learns the languages of the areas he was called to serve. In his biography, I, I read of him taking tutoring lessons so he could speak to the saints in French, Russian, German, Czechoslovakian, Greek, Spanish, Portuguese. There may have been others. I just did a quick survey. I remember going to the MTC in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and seeing on the wall there the dedicatory prayer that he gave in just simply beautiful Portuguese. Those who heard it were amazed. He spoke without notes and with excellent pronunciation. He's something of a linguist as well in the scripture study. You'll notice that he often explains the meaning of a scriptural passage by mentioning what the original word, word meant in Hebrew or Greek. And though he was an extremely busy, busy physician, President Nelson disciplined his time so that he could accept a church calling as a stake president. In doing this, he set an example for physicians everywhere across the church. Up to that time, it was, you'd rarely hear of a physician, an MD, becoming a stake president. But he did that, and then others followed in his, in his wake because he showed what could be done as a disciplined disciple. He also disciplined his time so he could spend as, with his, as a family uh, with his family. He loves to spend time with his wife, children, and grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Now, however, when he'd come in the room and see his children watching TV, he'd often tell them to turn it off because they're wasting their time. Okay. So here's a picture I want to show next. The next slide, if you, if you could pull that up. This is a picture of President Nelson disciplining himself. He took care of his, he takes care of his body, too. He's careful with his diet. He exercises. His posture is perfectly erect, and I'm with him. He's tra he exercises when he travels. He keeps his muscles toned so much that he's able to ski into his 90s. So here's this picture. On the left is President Nelson playing the organ. On the right, he's skiing in his 90s. And on the, right, on the middle, rather, and in the right, he's a surgeon. Here's a picture of a disciplined disciple you can keep in your mind. If you want to know what it looks like, here it is. If you want to know what it is like, just read about his life. Now, in conclusion, I've said a lot about discipline in this talk. But in the end, I want to talk about what is far and away the most important word in my title, discipleship. What matters most in this life, brothers and sisters, is not... Uh, who we are, but whose we are. What matters most is whose we are. What ultimately matters is, are we the faithful disciples of Jesus Christ? Have we taken his name upon us? Do we follow him? Are we trying to become like him? President Nelson has reminded us that we are not Mormons. We are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We do not worship or follow Mormon. We follow Christ as his disciples. And hence, we boldly declare with Mormon himself, Behold, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. My dear brothers and sisters, may we become disciples of Jesus Christ in the fullest sense of the word. Disciplined, yes, but above all, disciplined in the attributes of Christ, especially in charity, the pure love of Christ. For such people are true followers, meaning true disciples of Jesus Christ. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, pray unto the Father with all the energy of your heart that ye may be filled with this love, which he has bestowed upon all who are his true followers, his disciples of his Son, Jesus Christ, that ye may become the sons of God, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. In the name of Jesus Christ, my Master, amen.